Good afternoon. I'm Lori Sundberg. I'm the president of Kirkwood Community College. I would like to welcome you to the Iowa Ideas Conference. The Iowa Ideas Conference is in its fourth year, and it's an important opportunity to gather Iowans around a common experience. Really, now more than ever, we commit to providing opportunities for every Iowan to be part of this experience. 2020 is a year that none of us could have predicted. Yet in true Iowa Ideas fashion, we see this year as an opportunity to raise up the issues that will bring us a stronger tomorrow. Kirkwood is honored to support the Iowa Ideas Conference. It's a great example of partnering with others in our community to bring a terrific conference to our state and to Iowans. Enjoy the conference. Uh, welcome, everybody. First of all, to uh, day two of the Iowa Ideas Conference 2020. You're in the uh, Rethinking Education in COVID Times session. So hopefully you're in the right one. Thank you for joining us. We've got a great panel that I, I know is, is ready to get started. So I don't want to take up a whole lot of time. Just a couple of real quick notes. First and foremost, we could not do this whole thing without our sponsors. So thank you to ITC Midwest, our presenting sponsor. And thank you as well to our track sponsor that is sponsoring this education uh, track, which is Kirkwood Community College. I've got a quick uh, uh, welcome from President Lori Sundberg from Kirkwood that I would love to play. If, uh, if, if you take a look at my screen, uh, you should see uh, directly above on the right a button that says uh, welcome. Um, and, and if you want to click on that, that should uh, show you a, a, uh, an introduction from Lori Sundberg. So I'm going to give you just a real quick moment uh, to, to browse that, if you would. All right, and, and as that wraps up, you should be able to just click back to uh, live stream and, and that should show you my picture again, hopefully there. Uh, just a couple of uh, last notes. This is the last official session of Iowa Ideas 2020 as far as the breakout sessions go, but we do have a couple of additional uh, really interesting opportunities that I wanna invite you to, to make sure you check out. Immediately after this, we're gonna have our closing keynote speaker, David Kennedy from the National Network for Safe Communities with some really great information. I think that's gonna be a great uh, session. And then from noon to one, uh, there will be the Big Ideas Virtual Social. So really pick a room, learn about groups and initiatives that are happening, uh, a lot of people that are hard at work and how you can get involved. So hopefully we can continue the work that we've done over the course of the last couple of days uh, as we go throughout the remainder of the year and into uh, hopefully a, a, I think we can all agree a, a more positive 2021. So with that, want to welcome the uh, panel here and turn everything over to Grace King. Hi, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I am the education reporter for the Gazette, and today we'll be speaking with Cedar Rapids Community School District Superintendent Noreen Bush, Director of the Iowa Department of Education, Ann Lebo, and Trace Pickering, who's the Director of Iowa Big. Uh, thank you, panelists, for joining us. So Trace, uh, let's start with you. Can you kind of explain what Iowa Big is and the challenges the program faced um, when schools closed in March. Yeah, thanks Grace. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, Iowa Big is a program shared by four school districts in the Cedar Rapids Metro. Um, we are a, a half day program for about 90% of our kids. They can take core academic uh, courses uh, through a project-based environment. Uh, so we're out in the community doing authentic projects with business, nonprofit, government. Um, we were no different than probably all the other schools in March, uh, kind of flat-footed when, when things shut down. And, um, you know, some of our schools, the learning was mandatory, others was optional. And so that really presented a challenge for us to kind of keep our projects going. So um, we, we had put in place things to help the kids meet their standards and that, but we've had to really rethink this um, This summer about if and when this happens again, how do we maintain our projects uh, and do so in a, in a virtual environment? Thank you. Um, and you, the Cedar Rapids School District is, is one of the districts you work with. Um, how did you and uh, Superintendent Bush work together 
um, to get through the spring and start again in August. Well, September. <laughs> yeah, so um, I have four bosses. Um, Doreen at Cedar Rapids Schools. Um, I've got uh, Doug Wheeler at Prairie and uh, Shannon Bisgard at Linmar and Danny Trimble at Alburnett. So uh, the five of us meet about uh, every eight weeks, nine weeks or so um, for me to give project and updates to big and talk through challenges, financial and otherwise. Uh, you know, for us in, in March, uh, Noreen and her colleagues were great making sure we were getting all the information we needed. And we were, we were always just trying to manage needs and expectations of the four districts. So um, with, with the support we get, it made it really easy actually. Um, Superintendent Bush, would you like to jump in there and talk about how um, you kind of prepared students for online learning and uh, specifically working with Iowa Big? You bet. And so uh, we do have the great privilege of having um, the relationship with that metro area that Trace has already described. And so whether it be big or something else, we really try to keep each other in the loop. It's a very collaborative group in Cedar Rapids. So I think that's one thing that I have just been so um, appreciative of is a group of colleagues from across not just the Cedar Rapids area, but really the state to share ideas about how we're going to best support our children together as an entire state. So um, using big as an example, um, you know, un the uniqueness in what what uh, Dr. Pickering has to manage with the four districts is there's a lot of puzzle pieces that have to move all the time. And I think that actually maybe I don't know if it better prepared us, but this has been a giant puzzle and it's shifting every day of how to respond and how to support individual students, school communities. So we have three comprehensive high schools, one alternative high school, all of those students have access to big and yet big has its own community uh, and environment. So there's a lot of negotiating sometimes that happens when you're trying to find the right answer to you know, serving students. But I would say that what we've tried to do through this whole um, situation with the pandemic and then also with Cedar Rapids, the derecho, is approach everything with care and love, um, supporting kids, trying to do the best for them, and really recognizing that sometimes our own barriers are our own mindsets. And so just being flexible in mindset and doing whatever we can um, to get kids to the ultimate goal. And um, so despite all the chaos, I think we've just tried to work to collaboratively to make sure that we're meeting those goals together. And I think that's what big models most for kids is like, you can try and approach something with a plan, but when you're working with a community organization, they have their own set of things that they have to accomplish. And we kids have this great opportunity to say, okay, in the adult world, I have to be flexible in my thinking. I have to be open to other people's perspectives. And so even when chaos is happening, what does it, what, what matters most is that relationship with that other person, listening, understanding, and supporting. So I know that sounds pretty up here, but honestly, that's how we get through each, each day. And I think that's what big, big faculty do all the time. They're negotiating with four organizations to really deliver on a promise for kids. Um, Director Lebo, you joined the Department of Education on March 13th, I think you've said, which was the day um, the coronavirus was categorized as a pandemic. Um, what were your immediate concerns about how this would affect learning long term and um, what do you hope for <laughs> the future? Yeah, so I think that, you know, it was Friday the 13th. And my first day at the job was at the State Emergency Operations Center. And it was the first day we sent out guidance for schools that was really focused on how do we respond to this and, and really emphasizing health and safety. Um, by day three is when we shut down schools and for the first time. So I think that really shifted what our concern was. You know, who would have ever thought that um, we would ever be in that position? And then as we, as we kind of navigated forward through that process, it became very um, evident the essential services that schools provide. Um, inequities that were exacerbated that we knew we needed to address and how could we work together to really find solutions. So schools um, really had a lot of things they needed to pay attention to when you're serving students and families in the midst of a lot of unknowns. And I think, um, you know, as we still work through this a little bit, one of the benefits is our ability to really rethink 
how we do things because we've had to. And so as we're rethinking how we do things, how can we do them better? How can we better serve our families and communities? How can we better understand the strong ties between the schools and communities? Again, the essential services that schools provide um, have never been more pronounced than they are right now. And we want to make sure we build on that. Programs like BIG, partnerships like Cedar Rapids and Iowa BIG and the schools that they have um, strengthen those ties. And I think that's a model we want to continue. So collectively, we're thinking different. We're mobilizing differently. We're looking at different learning platforms. You know, the ability to shift online for some schools is really easy. And for some, it was a, it was a much bigger lift. So as we go forward, um, how can we better support that and support schools to think about what that learning can look like and who it benefits most? <laughs> Yeah, um, and si Senate File 2310 uh, allows for online school during this coronavirus pandemic. Um, but is there a benefit to extending the option of online learning? Um, and what would have to happen for online learning to be a permanent fixture in our education system? Yeah, so I think what this whole experience is going to teach us is, is who does it serve well and what permanent place should it serve in our learning. Um, prior to 2310, you know, schools could apply to be an online provider, but it was only for some students. So within the window of 2310, it allows us to use that much more broadly. So I think what we need to um, learn throughout this process is what helps it to, to um, serve kids well? What kids does it serve well? Because I know there still continues to be some challenges there. And then there would need to be a legislative change to make sure that could um, continue. We are building a um, expanded online platform as part of a grant that we received from Secretary DeVos. The department was awarded $17.7 .7 million to build an expanded platform um, that we're referring to as eLearning Central to help connect the state corner to corner to figure out, you know, for schools that can't offer something, how can we better connect them? How can we build a platform that's sustainable to help mitigate costs for districts? We were able to reimburse kind of a short-term solution for schools for this year through Canvas or reimbursing for other programs they have. Um, but we know that something like this is going to have to permanently be in place to continue, not for all kids, but for some kids, it really does serve them well, and it helps schools connect in different ways. So we want to use that money, money to provide a permanent platform as well, but there will have to be a permanent solution if, we've, if we feel that this is something we want to continue, and I think this experience has probably taught us that it is, um, but we might need to rethink what it looks like, and so we're, we're actually bringing together a group of stakeholders to help shape that. Um, and then as part of that process, have teachers involved in help building what that looks like as well. So again, this is something that was probably needed. Um, so as a result, we'll be better because of, but we need to keep working on what that, the best vision of what that will be um, actually looks like. And that's what we're starting to do now. Um, Superintendent Bush, do you uh, see benefits to online learning? What might those be? And um, what improvements uh, need to be made if this is going to be a long-term um, option for students? Yeah, I think that um, there are absolutely benefits. But then, and there's also, um, I think there's always, there's balances in any situation. And so there's absolutely opportunity with online learning, but it doesn't replace that human relationship and how important it is for play-based learning, for example, for early learners and just socialization, you know, amongst people. So I think sometimes that was the fear even prior to the pandemic is like, would online learning like replace teachers well teachers are the ones who have to deliver you know that that instruction so what i will say is what i've seen is a pronouncement of equity and access i will use big as an example um, when big started um, there were students in one district who already were in a one-to-one -one environment and would have laptops and then there were students from another school district who didn't have laptops issued and they when they're doing collaborations there was truly on a project on collaborative project certainly there was access to desktop computers at big but you could see a pronouncement of inequity um, just amongst districts Cedar Rapids, we launched a one-to-one -one effort at high school level um, uh, last year, so that helped us move some efforts forward. Um, and then, as Director Lebo's already indicated, then we had to. We had to accelerate 
for because of the situation that we we are in. So although this has been um, an opportunity for us to consider, it's actually been the only way that we can deliver instruction right now due to some of our buildings being closed, um, especially at the high school uh, level. And so uh, when I think about equity and access, it's about every child's getting what they need and when they need it. So we've had to um, deliver hotspots to families that need it, worked with the collaboration with a local provider um, who received a grant from um, um, from a state uh, state federal agency to, uh, that would now we have 300 400 families that are getting internet in their home because of that grant and so just continually trying to scale this and the whole time having conversations with our city and with our county about this is not just a school issue this is a community issue and so when kids are getting access to internet a family's getting access to it really and so I can't think of a better way to say, you know what, remove all barriers so our families are getting what they need for an economic point of view, from an education point of view. However, there are still barriers that we're trying to get through in that process. So um, trying to explain how to use the equipment and that's so challenging to do from a distance. So we've offered community hubs internet hubs with some local partner agencies um, and uh, that to me is just that next step so got a device but now I need a little human support and I got my teacher on the screen of how to so I think we're finding some ways to build these bridges but I do think when I when I think about the economic point of view and our, we want kids to be in um, internships and job shadows and maybe they didn't have a transportation but now they might have this as an opportunity, you know, so I think that we're going to be thinking differently uh, for a lot of reasons as we move forward. So some of it was forced, but some of it we're seeing it's going to open some doors absolutely uh, for, for students. Can I add something just to piggyback on that? Um, and I think that connectivity was a big piece of this too. The, the benefit, um, and that's maybe not the right word, but all the emergency funding that we received helped mitigate some of these issues. It helped us provide solutions. So whether it was through the ESSER funds um, or the money we talked about, we reimbursed for schools or the grant, but the GEAR funds were also designed um, or designated to support this connectivity issue because that's the, that's the other underlying concern and underlying inequity that if you're not connected you don't you can't do it doesn't matter what equipment you have you can't get connected so we used all the money we had to give out to schools to help mitigate some of those costs either provide the hot spots or pay for service for families the challenge is if there's no connectivity so you know for, for cedar rapids right now with the derecho they they had all kinds of concerns because there was there wasn't even any service. But if we think statewide, the benefit to families that that provides and the fact that now we could use emergency funds to provide solutions and OCIO is working on some more long-term sustainability solutions. You know, the governor has prioritized getting these, using this money to connect the state because once we can get everybody connected, it can eliminate one of those inequities that was exacerbated through this process that we hopefully will have a permanent solution for going forward because it does provide an expanded benefit to the whole community if we can get that um, resolved. Um, our are you still seeing problems with students being able to connect if, if they're enrolled in online learning or um, if they had to learn from home because um, they were in quarantine for a couple weeks? So we are seeing um, certainly some situations accelerated, but there's still some um, we're doing what, what significant family engagement work in Cedar Rapids. It's one of our um, focuses uh, just to connect with families. And that was coming prior to all of the, the crisis that we're in. So it means as, a, as an adult, our teachers have worked so, so hard. Just that is where the difference is, right? The relationship between a child and their teacher. It's a number one thing that can really impact their learning. And so our teachers who are taking on so much other things, so many other things are making sure that they're communicating with families um, with this family engagement work that we're doing. So, this first rounds of calls have been, do you have what you need? Are you okay? If your child's learning from home, what resources, additional resources might you need? So those connections, we are finding that there are some barriers from, for families. Some of it's um, technology. Some of it is definitely infrastructure issues. Um, whether the, and they may even already have their own service provider, but because of the derecho, things have become uneven or not consistent. Or so that's what we're finding. And um, 
you know, video streaming like this takes a lot more um, uh, uh, capacity than just going audio. And so trying to find those ways and also helping our teachers and even administrators understand you know how to how to problem solve that so i would say that every day brings a new set of learning and then we try to we've got a landing page for our families our help desk which used to really just support our educators and our staff members now is for all of our families and our students as well so it's trying to expand and problem solve and provide the resources so some of it's technology some of it's just learning how to do it this is completely new for families and new for staff so support 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 and I, I call it training ugly you know it's like we're learning as we go it's not always pretty um but trying to get get everybody what they need um as quickly as we can and now, so yes there are still there are still things that are interrupting um the process and so we did open it up um here this past week for families who may want to transition if they're currently online and they in in-person opportunity is available to them we have some families that are switching just because this was too much for, for them to, to be able to manage right now. Uh, teachers are, are kind of feeling the strain of this. I don't think there's a teacher you would talk to that wouldn't say that they would give everything for their students, um, but they're tired. The family engagement phone calls take up a lot of time. And um, with students uh, possibly switching from online to in-person or vice versa on Monday, uh, they're concerned that it'll feel like a, a brand new school year again. Um, I guess, can you just talk about um, the teachers and, and um, how the district is kind of working to help get them through this year? They are amazing individuals. Uh, and, oh, and I would say everybody's feeling that, I call it the cascading effect, right? Everybody's just feeling this compounded piece. So one thing that we've done is um, just really listen to what's, what's, um, what's the stress, what can we do to help. And I think they all understand the purpose and the reason, and you know, absolutely it's important to talk to our families, but managing it, so like extending timelines, reducing the number of, of, of frequencies, I guess that we would say these family engagement call rounds are expected, um, but then also giving them time, collaboration time, time for preparation, and so it becomes this delicate balance. We have, we have instructional hours that are required and we want to make sure kids are getting what they need in the learning environment and yet we need to have staff feeling ready and prepared as well to support students. So um, we're just using resources we have to kind of shift um, to give teachers more time to prepare and also making sure kids are still getting their education. Um, and so listening, listening, listening and adjusting along the way. And so that's really what we're doing. It sounds simple, but that's the best that we could do. And I think that we just have to remain flexible and um, we it's, we're in the fourth week at Cedar Rapids and we couldn't start because of the derecho. Other districts have been in this, you know, longer than we have. And wherever I go, wherever I listen, teachers are feeling so stressed because everything is different. And so just making sure that we're promoting self-care um, and but giving them time to do it. So that's, time is the biggest commodity right now. Um, Trace, are you are you seeing the same things at Iowa Big? Um, how are your teachers uh, dealing with teaching during the pandemic? Yeah, we've uh, <clears throat> our teachers have had a nice advantage with when Linmar, Albernet, and Prairie were able to start mid September. Um, Noreen and her team gave uh, Cedar Rapids students permission to start then too, so that. Um, I think that eases a lot of pressure on the teachers. We can see our kids two or three times a week when the hybrid model. Um, they were just um, a lot like the kids. They were just so ready to get reconnected uh, on a human level uh, with with kids that uh, um, they're just, they were just so glad to be back and be able to have a um, in person connection. Even a couple of days a week with kids made a huge difference. Um, I think psychologically, it not only helped them, it helped the kids. Um, I don't know if this is a direct correlation, but we certainly saw kids coming to Iowa big this fall with um, as, as excited as they tend to come for this opportunity, they were doubly excited. You could just tell they, they had probably taken school for granted. And after being gone for six months, I think many of them realized that um, 
our community gives them a nice gift and they should take advantage of it. So I think our teachers feel the same way. I think their, their biggest fear right now is, um, you know, if we were told we had to stop for two weeks and go back to virtual, they would, that would be a challenge for them because they so much love the contact, so. Um, and from what I, I understand, uh, Iowa Big is focused on hands-on projects. Um, how have you kind of changed that model or, or have you um, to be able to pivot to online if necessary? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, our model uh, is, is well suited uh, for, for this kind of switch. Uh, our students aren't, aren't in traditional classes like English and sociology, all that's blended and, and put together in a, in a project with a partner. So um, the ability to do that, um, you know, synchronously, synchronously asynchronously, face-to-face uh, -face online is very fluid and easy uh, in that regard. Uh, you know, we just had to take the same precautions as, as everybody else. So um, some, of our, some of our community partners, um, they Zoom in to the kids' meetings. Uh, a lot of them wanted to at least meet the the kids want so you know they follow the exact same protocols we all follow around face masks and cleanse you know, cleanliness those kind of things uh, and that's worked really well i think for us the biggest shift was uh, a desire to figure out what the kids cared about what projects interested them and getting them on a project uh, much more quickly than normal because we wanted to at least have the opportunity to build relationships with that group of kids and their partner in the event that we would have to go to a you know a two week quarantine virtual we could we just felt more comfortable and confident that the kids could carry out these you know meetings via zoom and that uh, if they had had some uh, initial relationship building with their team so um, we feel like we're in a good place uh, you know heaven forbid we'd have to we'd have to go into quarantine here this fall i think we're in a good place where, where we wouldn't see much of a hiccup at all we would just keep our projects rolling. We would just do them virtually instead of uh, periodically in person like we do now. Um, are there other benefits to providing this online model? Um, I, I think in the past we've spoken about how um, virtual counseling services can be an option for students now. Um, so can, can you talk about that um, and what other opportunities you see? Yes, so telehealth, tele-support um, um, in regards to the mental health world, um, that access uh, for our students. And I'll say our partner agencies, they've had to pivot too. And so, and they're so willing to go come with us because we're all focused on supporting kids together. So it's been very um, collaborative. But yes, yeah, so telehealth services, I do see um, that there's um, greater connection to um, some community agencies. So it's kind of, you know, I've always talked about, you know, the continuum of options for, for kids. And if I think about big being really this competency based education platform, and then it feels like this or environment, you're going to go traditional high school, or you're if you want that kind of unique experience and project based learning experience, you got to go to big, I think we're going to get a greater continuum of kids can within our high schools, so that if you really want that complete experience at big, it's going absolutely, we still want to provide that opportunity. But I think we're going to be able to scaffold over time because our community partners are having to shift as well. So yes, telehealth services, but also those community partners services. I was with a group of kids um, at one of our high schools and they had a guest speaker coming in. It was a, now granted it was um, a, a literature class and a local um, author was going to participate in a discussion with them and sometimes in the past that would have been an absolute barrier or you're worried about the technology or you got to wait for a day for that person to come in person. It was like sure I can show up tomorrow no problem and everybody's on the screen and having that conversation together. So it, the immediacy of what can happen to have an invitation and connecting our kids to their community. I love what Trace said about our kids are now seeing maybe even a greater value of schools important, but it connects me to the community too. And I and that's what we want to be able to provide those those uh, connections. Um, so how has the cr coronavirus kind of forced districts to think more innovatively, um, the way they deliver content, uh, connect with students and families? I'll be 
I'm sure Director Levo could comment it from across the state perspective on this, but I'll just give one example. We've had to look at our curriculum and what's really essential. And, and um, I'm a high school English teacher, and I'll tell you, I, I could give you all kinds of things that I think are super important for kids to experience in high school English classes, right? But what's really essential are the skills that they're going to gain from my English class. I could give you a, a list of books that I think they should experience, but the skills that they gain is what's most important. So I think in a, in a high school perspective, we've had to take a hard look at our content and really the you cannot replace that human relationship. We've put a lot of emphasis on human relationships uh, on the front end of this year, love and care for everybody, get, know, know what kids need, and we will get you to the content. Um, so I think we've had to really identify those essential standards and um, making them even more relevant to for future readiness for kids. So um, seeing teachers adjust every day and that is that time piece that you're talking about grace so i'm i'm not only teaching platform difference i've had to also change how my my content and how i deliver it i've had to change um how i'm even giving feedback and very willing to do it but every day is like feels like first year teaching for the most veteran teacher uh director levo yeah go ahead do you have yeah, anything no, to I add to that well, and I just, you know, even outside of the academic piece, I think the part, another part that's been reinforced is, is that you need to understand um, where your kids are coming from out, when they're outside of school. You know, it's always been important to understand the kids and other factors that might be influencing their lives. But over the past, you know, now eight months, um, that really has been heightened. You know, there are families that are being impacted by this in so many ways, and we don't know to what extent the children are feeling that. And so as kids come in, whether they're coming into the school or you're reaching out to them virtually, we have to do a better job of understanding what's going on behind the scenes because it's very, very different. The thing we saw in the spring as kids were doing um, virtual learning and there was a, um, you know, the most, of, most of them were doing voluntary because, you know, this was impacting life in a much different way. Kids were, were taking on roles in families they hadn't before. Families were being impacted in ways that they hadn't been previously. So um, that piece is ever more important now in a lot of different ways. And we're seeing schools pay more attention to that. And I think that needs to continue. And that's another one of those things that you know, is a priority that got brought to the top of the table because of the situation, but it's one that should have anyway. So I think Again, understanding families, understanding kids, connecting schools and communities in a much different way um, will continue to be important and hopefully a positive thing um, at the end of all of this. Yeah, I, th I think that that family piece is really interesting. And um, do you expect uh, schools, teachers, relationships with families that, as a unit to change because of this? Um, and how could that affect kind of the future of education? Well, just based on things, you know, like Superintendent Bush is sharing how you're having to outreach to families in different ways. I mean, that's one of the things you're always taught to do anyway, but well, my lights went off because I'm not moving <laughs> there. Um, but, but we're having to do it more now. So the more we can understand our kids and the families that we serve, that is better for everyone. And I, I, it's, it's a lot of work, but we're serving kids and that, and that is an important part of that job. So I think it will continue. I think it's gonna have to continue, um, but I think that definitely will benefit the instruction these kids provide and benefit the services we can provide. Because we're, again, it's more than just education. The essential service a school provides is more than just the academic piece. And no more than any other point in time has it been true than now. And so let's not forget that as we go forward. So all of that, I think, will help us build better services for the communities and the families that we serve. Yeah, Superintendent Bush, do you have anything to add to that? So I'm seeing that um, roles are shifting um, within uh, staff members. So, for example, when the if, if it's a family who's remote being a remote learner in, in their home um, the thing that's most important is getting them their device and getting the hotspot or whatever it is they need so that now they're getting a strong connection with a technology department where usually like your first connection is like you know school secretary is your like number one relationship when you're a new family so it's seen in these roles are kind of shifting but I'm what I'm seeing is that our families um, are also reaching out to each other 
and you know what what's working for you what's not working for you and it can really um, be a close-knit com community yet at the same time want to make sure that there's not more inequities and so I think that's been our number one lens is just to make sure that um, underserved populations are we're paying really close attention to attendance um, kids being in school getting what they need and um, making sure that we're following up but I think families are also reaching out to schools for unless they have for many years but we're providing you know free meals for for all families right now and that's it's those nutrition aspects we're providing um you know the, now you know one of the discussions and grace you were at our board meeting monday night um one of our discussions um is like what's the role of schools um to provide um testing from a health perspective right Co access to covid when families don't have transportation to go get a test but i suspect that my child might have you know symptoms and make that so we we are we become those social conduits and so i think that's the relationship between schools and families and we've always had that relationship but it's become even more intensified now um and so hopefully that brings our families closer together with schools and we have this community partnership but we take that very seriously and recognize that is our role and that we are the welcome wagon um you know for our families so i think that will probably intensify um and continue and we'll just have to um our community school model like at hoover elementary school getting partner agencies right in our schools so our families have immediate access because the schools where they bring their kids and that they're together as families and then they support each other uh, speaking of testing um the cedar rapids district last week started releasing information on, on how many students were positive um and staff members too i think are you um are you seeing the numbers of positive cases that you expected to see is it less than or more than and do you think um parents are able to get their students tested to properly you know document that and do the contact tracing so i don't know if i knew or even had a hunch of like what the number would be um of positive cases within our district we're you know obviously we serve 17,000 up, upwards of 17,000 kids you know between 16 17,000 um and um and then therefore then families as well so i, I just knew the um county data you know is what was re being reported um so we know that the number of tests i don't know if i had a hypothesis of how many cases i thought would be positive um, I do know that our numbers on a weekly basis are like single digits for both students and staff. So sing, at least at this point in time, and if it comes up into a double digit, it's like in the teens. Um, if we had an uptick though, and all of a sudden we're getting, you know, a lot of um, positive cases within a week, um, to me then that is, we've got to lean on our county health department. They help us with contact tracing to say, okay, what are our next steps? So we're learning, you know, with the county um, on that. And I would say, I don't think we're that much different than other districts as I look at their data as well. And I think some districts are also um, reporting the number of people in quarantine. Um, and so, and to know the difference between isolation and quarantine is a big deal. And so, uh, I think that what we want to be able to do is make sure people feel safe and that absolutely our families have access to the resources that that they need so uh, we're working with a lynn county public health and our nursing team as well as our teachers who are the ones who are saying hey this is what i'm witnessing so the first three weeks of school we've been learning um, about what those needs are but also our athletic departments you know we supported athletics all summer and um worked so closely with Lynn County Public Health to contact trace, quarantine when we needed to, but also the, making sure that, you know, as a district, when kids came back to school, we are requiring, you know, the mask wearing. And so th that's the, some of the best mitigation that we can do is this, hand washing, hand sanitizing, and trying to do as many preventative measures as we can. So yeah, I think that we're going to continue to learn along the way, but I can't say that I was necessarily surprised with numbers because I didn't really know what to expect. So we're living where, we're, where the data is right now. Um, Director Lebo, from a statewide perspective, are you seeing um, more students being tested? Um, do you think more students should be tested? Um, what, what do you think about the numbers of coronavirus cases in schools right now? 
So you, I mean, I think a lot of that information is what's being reported to, to public health. Um, so anything I say is sort of anecdotal. Um, most of the feedback we are receiving is that um, cases are not, they're not getting it in the school. Um, and then we've shifted some guidance in terms of the uh, quarantining um, procedures that would have to be in play depending on wh whether or not they're wearing masks. But a lot of that information, you know, since public health tracks all that, um, you know, I could certainly get you in contact with someone there to, to give you some more information on what that looks like, but that's what we're seeing just from the information that I'm getting. Um, do you expect to see long-term, maybe social emotional effects from the coronavirus? Um, when do you see those really playing out in the education system for students? And, and how are you, what preemptive measures are you trying to take right now? Um, Noreen, Trace? Either of you? So I think, and Trace, I think I, this is uh, research he's experienced for a long time too about the importance of social emotional connection. So what we know, um, we've, we've taken um, some efforts as a district to really research trauma-informed care practices prior to the pandemic even. And what we know about a an incident of trauma, and Iowa's got a lot of research around the ACEs model, which is adverse childhood experiences. And so we, what we know is that a traumatic incident may not even surface in a social emotional development of a child for up to maybe even seven years after an incident occurs. So that's why adolescents and teenagers, it really, we got, you might see a behavior you've never seen before and you're trying to dig in, like, where is that coming from? And it may not even be from a traumatic incident, but I think what we are trying to um, be prepared for is as we move forward, we've got the current state right now, we have families who are experiencing homelessness who've never experienced it before because they lost their home because of a natural disaster. And we have um, families who were refugees prior to coming to Cedar Rapids and have had terrible experiences in refugee camps and then, you know, found their peace place in Cedar Rapids several years ago. And now they're homeless again because of the derecho. And then the pandemic on top of all of this and people just being worried, worried, worried. So what we know is that we've got to provide proactive support. So that is the relationships with the adults in front of them, but we have to provide supports for our adults as well. So as much as we tried to do that before the school year even started, now everybody's in it and that stress levels come up. So what do we need to, to do to surround supports around adults so that they can feel like they can support kids? And so, um, we have what are called connection circles as an example, as an activity that our teachers do with our students, kind of get together connected in the morning and how's your day? Anything happened yesterday? Do you need, what do you need to get through the day today? It's just those simple structures to make sure we're connecting with kids all the way to what I would consider those telehealth supports, mental health supports, referrals for families, when we're seeing that, you know, beyond that connection circle, what kids might need. We, our school counselors are amazing, but they're managing the academics and the mental health pieces and all sorts of things. So when a child really needs more um, mental health support, we lean on community partners for that and, and medical health world. So we are very fortunate to have a continuum of services, but making sure that we know um, that families know that those services are available. Uh, uh, one Trace, thing that, you, go ahead, oh, Anne. Trace, you can go first. One thing that we, um, you know, when we started all this and we were doing our re return to learn resources, we had a whole section just on this because we knew it was going to be a concern. And we were trying to provide tools. Um, but what we're going to do in addition to that is actually um, have kind of a three-part webinar series to help better connect um, with schools and services on this because we are seeing that it is a concern. You know, it's not just the families, it's everyone. And I think we want to make sure we're being very proactive and providing some resources for that. So we will be sending out more information on that, but we think it's going to be important um, to not lose sight of that because I don't see that as being a short-term issue. Um, that's going to be one we're going to need to make sure we pay attention to. I don't, don't really have a much, much to add to what was been, what's been said. You know, just um, We've slowed things down. Um, we used to have kids on two projects at a time. They're only on one right now. And we spend the rest of the time uh, much more focused, uh, even more so than the past, on relationships and just talking to kids and you know, just creating an environment where they feel like they can come and 
you know, and, and be safe and, and talk about things they need to. And so that's, um, you know, it's kind of a, for us actually a little bit of a silver lining. That's something we wanted to get better at anyway. And this has given us that almost like my teachers feel like they have permission now to slow down a bit and even go deeper with kids. So that's been nice. That's awesome. Um, we have a question from the audience here. Uh, special needs students and their families have been especially challenged by the pandemic. Many of these students need intensive help that they are no longer receiving. How is this being addressed? I wasn't sure if you wanted from, I know Director Lebo can comment on this as well. So we do have um, remote instructors and even remote paraeducators who are supporting the students who are in remote environments that are uh, for special education services. However, we also know that um, the kids who would qualify for the most services, perhaps it's not just learning and cognitive needs, but also medical needs, um, social developmental needs, we are providing on-site instruction for them. So their models pretty much kind of remain the same. Um, they, we had to put them in different locations because of our buildings issues. <laughs> so for example, Jefferson and Washington high schools in a section of their building that was still available or hosting for multiple programs throughout our district. So uh, we wanted to make sure that um, it, it, as many in-person opportunities to support our special needs students were available. However, families who are choosing remote instruction or perhaps that program is not available yet in person. Uh, we have folks working remotely and again it's new for everybody and so making sure that kids are getting what they need um, and so I think that we're we're growing in that in regards to the remote instruction for special needs um, but uh, that's too is orienting everybody to this environment and so that is a challenge but uh, we that's why we want to make sure that we're still offering in-person opportunities and so as our buildings become reopened uh, as they get rebuilt here uh, from the derecho um, that has been definitely a concern and not just special education population also our english language learners um, newcomers to the country uh, think about that challenge this you know and so we've tried to provide that in-person opportunity as well one uh, unique example that was shared with me for these services is uh, Clear Creek Amana purchased a, um, I don't know if it's, it's a truck, it's not a bus, but it's a, a vehicle that they outfitted to provide services to the families. So every, every day, every week, they actually go to homes and have sort of a classroom set up in the back of this to provide some of those services for families who couldn't come to the buildings because we know that, so, that some of the learning and support they need can't be replaced virtually. But you know, that's one of those innovative ideas that when you ask a teacher to solve a problem, they come up with a solution uh, that the superintendent was willing to support. There's a great way and to provide services that could be ongoing. So, I mean, I think examples like that, the more we can share them, help us think differently about how we connect with our families and think about the value too of just going out to, to the home and to the family to provide that service, the benefits that come from that as well. So, um, you know, it is, it is a different challenge and it's an important um, area to make sure that we're not overlooking in any way because needs have to be met. Um, you know, virtually it doesn't always work for all kids. So as teams get together, their IEP team, their instructors, and they work with the families and say, how do we, how do we make this um, look different? How do we provide these services that they have to have during this time? Working together for solutions will be so important in keeping that communication open um, and get everybody at the table. We'll, we wanna make sure that continues as well. Um, I, I feel like online school can also provide opportunities for smaller districts to get um, resources that they wouldn't be able to afford previously. Um, Director Lebo, would you like to talk about that? Yeah, actually, that's one of the um, priorities with uh, the eLearning Central and the grant that we got. Um, is trying, you know, I'm from a smaller district and that's where I was a principal. And so, it, you know, we would have 2080 agreements with other districts for courses we couldn't meet, um, the requirements for kids that wanted to take something we couldn't offer. Our goal is to really expand that um, corner to corner statewide. So no matter where you live, you have the opportunity to connect with courses um, that you may not have um, because of your, your location. And so we want to, that's another one of those inequities we want to really address. Teachers teaching a class, you know, in, in Sioux City, if they have extra spaces, kids in Granny Center can join. Um, you know, so it's really expanding that platform to get different types of learning. And again, connecting us, you know, we don't want um, your zip code to be an inhibitor of, of your opportunity to learn. And so the more we can expand on that and, and help 
pay for it. I mean, the, 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 the benefit of having all this money that we got is to help build this for districts because there is a cost. And so we want to mitigate that cost for the school so that everybody can be part of it. So that will be something that um, that is the priority of what we're working on going forward in terms of that initiative. Um, Superintendent Bush, I don't know, do you have anything that you'd like to add to that? Um, what opportunities do you see could be added to your district because of this? So I do think it's that that connection beyond the four walls of a school, we say. And so I think that's what Big does so well. I think Trace could have a good reflection on this as he works with Although three of us are larger districts that, you know, Cedar Rapids is the only multi high school um, district that works with big. And so uh, one of our districts is especially small and having access to it is so important. But I would say what we're finding is even as an adult, I am connecting to people from across the nation right now. Um, I called, uh, you know, s some colleagues in Florida and in California who have experienced hur hurricanes and um, earthquakes. <laughs> and how do they handle the double crisis, you know, as we were looking at the derate show and what you do for staff and how do you support students and what would you do when you didn't have buildings anymore. And so I'm finding that I can have more national connections. That's absolutely one for our students. You know, there's this you know, 15 years ago, this book called The World is Flat, and that is kids have access to information very quickly, very readily. Um, uh, not to comment on your, you know, generation, um, Grace, but I think you've grown up differently than even how I grew up between our generations, and that that access to information is one thing, but access to other people from another culture, another community, and to understand them. And from a world point of view, it's right at the tip of our fingers right now. And so that is what my hope is for access, not just for small districts, but for any child anywhere, no matter what the size of your district, connection to understand each other better, to create a inclusive, supportive, diverse world for kids who don't necessarily have access to that in my neighborhood. Yeah, I would, I would echo that just um, even in our experience here at BIG with um, four districts and seven high schools, just the, the disconnection between kids in different high schools and different districts within 10 miles of each other was kind of shocking to us. And so um, it's been wonderful to see, um, see students from a small high school like Albernet interact with big school kids, you know, and, and the, it's just interesting the uh, the assumptions they have about each other and all of that gets gets stripped away when they realize they're, they're just kids trying to, they're all kids just trying to find their way and figure things out. So the more we can expand that and, you know, I think this gives all of us an opportunity to look at, um, you know, how can we collaborate more? Like BIG isn't an affordable program for any one district to take on, but with four together it is, right? So what are some other things we can do along that line? to make, make this better moving forward. I, I think that's interesting, also considering the opportunities it could open up for students um, looking at job shadowing or internships, um, maybe students who otherwise would have transportation barriers. Um, uh, would either of you like to talk about that? Superintendent Bush? Yeah, I think that's awesome, right? And so, um, I, I've had the pleasure to uh, sit on the um, Iowa Business Council has a subgroup called the Business Education Alliance. And so a couple superintendents from the state with the CEOs, as well as the region's presidents and, and Drake University president, we're having this conversation of how do we create this prosperous state? Um, and yet there's, there's gaps right now of um, finding employees. And that was prior to the pandemic, you know, this has impacted everybody's uh, workforce. And so um, when I, so I, I've met some folks through that experience, John Deere being one of them in Quad Cities. And so how do we connect our kids to the John Deere community from Cedar Rapids, right? And using this as a way to do that. And I, there's nothing that can replace, you know, a real life human experience walking through a John Deere plant. But when we're talking about initial communications and better understanding what advanced manufacturing actually means from a state lens, I think there's a lot of assumptions or people don't, and parents don't understand what opportunities are available for their kids with apprenticeships and whatnot. And if we can have more of these kind of Zoom sessions, 
Iowa Ideas, this is a great example. Think about that. If we could host it just for kids and parents connected from across the state, did you know this opportunity existed for your child? And breaking down those, those walls and just get information is power. And we want to get, you know, that in, information to our families and so that they can get access for their kids for, for the next step so they can be future ready Iowa. So I just see all kinds of possibilities uh, for internships, job shadows, but just getting access to the information. The, the, the structures are, exist right now, but having the mindset you know, shift of like, maybe, maybe a four-year college path is, is not the best fit for a student. We want them to be, we will skill them to have that as a path, but there's a lot of other pathways for kids right now, including the military. I love that idea of having a kids type of IY ideas conference. That would be very cool. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we have about five minutes left here. I want to give you all an opportunity for any final comments you might have. Um, would anyone like to volunteer to start? You know, Dr. Lebo? I, I'll just start by saying, you know, the, the thing that makes um, all this work is partnerships, relationships, making connections. You know, even before we started talking, um, Superintendent Bush and, and Dr. Pickery and I were all talking because we've met previously. You know, the way we connect and, and build is that we, we learn from another, one another, we maintain relationships, we build connections with others, and we all focus on what's best for kids. And so, you know, some of the value of things like this, you know, I, I, I look forward to the day where I'm not on Zoom all day, but look at the connections we can make. Um, and I think there is value there. So we have amazing, amazing people in Iowa. Um, that I will say without a hesitation through this whole process, I've seen more than anything, is people really just stepping up to get things done and take care of one another. Um, when, when it just seems to continue to throw things at us, no one more so than, than Superintendent Bush right now and, and the Cedar Rapids di District and the derecho. So I think this is what makes this work and I appreciate you putting this together and absolutely look forward to having more conversations like this because there is an opportunity for us to grow um, and I absolutely believe we will get there. Yeah, I would just say um, I'm excited by what I see from educators from Iowa and across the country, seeing this as an opportunity to make some significant changes that we've been talking about for a long time. And I think, you know, I always look for the silver lining in these kind of things. And, and I think this is causing our communities to, to be a little more open about some of the things that we've wanted to do. Uh, I know there's been lots of conversation um, in, the, in the circles I run in about the opportunity costs especially for high school kids of having a, a tight seven period day, five days a week that, you know, every other day and more focused instruction. And like Noreen said, getting really clear about what standards really matter uh, could open up all kinds of time for students to pursue other interest areas or to deepen things they care about. So I'm, I'm just excited about those kind of conversations that are happening um, among a broader constituency that we've seen in the past. Yeah, and I think I would just echo all of that and just say the, the, the opportunity for collaboration amongst um, connecting kids across districts, uh, connecting uh, teachers across districts. You know, I was a high school English teacher, but I was also a theater teacher. And when you're the only theater teacher, you know, you're the only theater teacher and there's no one necessarily doing what you do. But when I could connect with another theater teacher, so I think about that sm the small schools who are the onlys, they live on a little island there in their small community, now they can connect to others this way. And so it's professional collaboration, but it's also just connecting our students to the things beyond the four walls of their schools. I think that that would be my greatest hope is one of the major outcomes from all of this. And that it, it does the forcing and have to think differently. Then I wonder at the end of this year what people will say, you know, I was worried about that, but I now I would never give it up. I would never do it differently now. And so it's forced me to change. And then also, now that I've been through it, this is what I would do differently. And maybe what those taxing things are and the emotional stress. It, when the emotional stress can come down and people will be able to reflect and think a little more clearly, I look forward to those reflective conversations. Our teachers will be able to tell us what really made the difference. And, um, and I think systemically we'll see, our kids will tell us 
what made the difference. And those reflective conversations, I think, um, I look forward to that when the pandemic is gone. <laughs> Well, I think that is a great note to end on. Thank you to our panelists for talking to us about how we're rethinking education um, during this very chaotic time. Um, and thank you to the audience for your questions. If you'd like to further the conversation or have some questions for our panelists, you can direct message speakers through the Whova app. Um, and you can also hop over to networking rooms and connect with other attendees. So thank you so much for joining us for Iowa Ideas. Enjoy the rest of the conference.